I'm going to talk about XMRV and human disease, its association with prostate cancer and with chronic fatigue syndrome. What is XMRV? So these initials stand for quite a complicated name, xenotropic murine leukemia related retrovirus. Okay. And I'm going to go over each of these words because even to scientists, these are somewhat of a puzzle unless you are a retrovirologist, which is what I am. <laughs> so what is a retrovirus? And many of you probably know this quite well, but let's just go over it. So HIV is the most famous example of a retrovirus. Here's a diagrammatic representation of a retrovirus. What is a retrovirus? It has a, a lipid envelope, which is derived from the cell it was made in. And uh, in this envelope are the envelope glycoproteins which help this retrovirus attach to its receptor on the cell. And this will become meaningful in a, in a minute. Just keep this in your uh, mind for the moment that there's an envelope protein that needs to attach to a receptor in order for the virus to get in. Um, inside, the, uh, inside the envelope is a nucleocapsid or a protein shell that contains the viral genome. And the retroviral genome is special in that it is made up of RNA. And then the reason it's called a retrovirus, I get this all the time, meaning retro, meaning like is this from the 50s or something? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. A retrovirus is because normally in the cell, the way information flows is from DNA to RNA and from RNA to proteins. In a retrovirus, um, it flows backwards from RNA to DNA. So this, this genome is copied in the cell by a special enzyme that the virus brings with, with it called reverse transcriptase into DNA. And then this retroviruses do this other neat thing. They take this DNA and using this enzyme called integrase, they insert it into the host genome. So once a cell is infected by a retrovirus, that cell and its progeny forever and ever will contain a DNA version of that retrovirus, okay? Um, and all of this will become um, uh, important when we discuss tests because you can, dis you can make tests that will detect viral RNA, you can make tests that will detect the DNA inside the cell, um, and you can also obviously detect viral proteins. So, so we will discuss each of those as we go forward. But this is what a retrovirus is. Uh, what is a xenotropic retrovirus? So normally, mice um, have a bunch of um, what are called murine leukemia viruses floating around in mice populations. And they're called exogenous because the mice don't get, are not born with it. They acquire that infection um, from another mouse. And um, one of those uh, could affect the germline, you know, um, retrovirus will replicate throughout the body and they could integrate into the germline. And then the virus that results from that is called an endogenous MLV, which means that this virus is now propagated from mouse mother to child, you know, through successive generations. Um, and retroviruses acquire mutations all the time because the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which copies um, retroviral material, is not very good at proofreading. So they acquire mutations, and you may have heard this in, in HIV all the time, that you, know, you uh, get drug-resistant virus, and that's because primarily because RT is not such a uh, high-fidelity enzyme. So um, these viruses acquire mutations. When they acquire mutations in their envelope protein, they can no longer bind to the receptor that was meant for them. And instead, they acquire specificity for another receptor. And what happens is uh, the receptor for um, these um, endogenous MLVs, um, there's a receptor called xenotropic and polytropic retrovirus receptor. And when they lose the ability to use the mouse receptor, some of these viruses acquire the ability to infect receptors of other species, okay? So a xenotropic virus um, means foreign, xeno meaning foreign. 
this, this mouse retrovirus, which was a mouse retrovirus, can no longer infect other mouse cells, but now has instead acquired the ability to infect other species, in this case, human. Okay? So that sort of explains how some, why the, the virus is called xenotropic murine leukemia-related retroviruses, because they started out from MLVs, and they acquired the ability to infect humans. So here's the seminal paper on the discovery of XMRV. So this came out in 2006 from the labs of Bob Silverman, Joe DeRisi, and Don Ganim, where they identified a novel gamma retrovirus in prostate tumors of patients who had a vari variation in their RNA cell gene. And we'll go over some of this stuff um, in a second. So it was the first xenotropic virus and gamma retrovirus identified in humans. Many gamma retroviruses are known to cause cancer in animals by pretty well-characterized mechanisms. Um, this paper by Urs et al. discovered XMRV in rare stromal cells in the prostate cancer, and they showed that there was a strong association between XMRV infection and mutations in the RNA cell gene. At that time, or just before this, because we got a preprint of this paper, we were primarily a lab that studied Maloney-Murine leukemia virus, which is another gamma retrovirus, and this causes leukemia in mice. And we thought about, you know, should we be studying XMRV? And we first said, nah, because cases without prostate cancer were not studied, so we thought, well, maybe it's just a virus that likes to hang out in all prostates, and it has nothing to do with cancer. And you have to think about that possibility. You know, picking up a virus in humans doesn't, in a particular disease, doesn't mean anything if all you've studied is that, is that disease. You have to study some controls as well, right? If I study CFS patients today and I say, oh, there's lots of E. coli in these people, well, guess what? You know, there's E. coli in all of us. So you have to sort of keep those things in mind as I talk you through this um, data. So, um, so the original study did not study patients without prostate cancer. The other puzzling thing that they saw was that the virus was only seen in non-malignant stromal cells. Now, no retrovirus known that causes cancer, and these are all mostly animal, uh, but there's only one retrovirus that causes cancer in humans, but none of them are present in a benign cell and there's a tumor somewhere in another cell. They all are present in the malignant cell. So this, this didn't fit. The other thing was that the association with the RNA cell variant suggested that only 10% of the population was susceptible to XMRV because only 10% of the population has this variation in RNA cell. So then we were looking at even a subset of that 10% and I was thinking, well, is this, is this going to be interesting? But, you know, here I am, and uh, we thought that it would be interesting because prostate cancer is a huge disease. You know, 3% of men die of prostate cancer today. And if XMRV causes prostate cancer, then we'd have new methods of prevention. We'd have a new marker for disease. We might be getting help in resolving difficult cases. You know, I'm sure you see this, that there are cases with high PSAs, and yet there's, on repeated biopsy, you don't see the cancer. And you know, what do you do with these people? And then, of course, there might be antiretroviral therapy. And you know, you can apply all of this to chronic fatigue syndrome as well. So we decided that we were going to study this. And today's talk, I'm going to talk to you about um, the experience of my lab and our research on prostate cancer, chronic fatigue syndrome, and on antivirals effective against XMRV. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive review of XMRV uh, today, and there's lots of very cool, very interesting data that's out there. Uh, but I'm only going to touch, touch on stuff that I understand best, which is really our work. So we started by taking uh, little pieces of XMRV from the lab that discovered it, and we assembled it into a proviral clone. We showed that that clone could make infectious virus, so we could generate virus in one cell, then we could put it into another cell, generate more virus, 
And then if we took that virus and we looked at it under the electron microscope, this is what it looked like. And this is an image that's now reproduced everywhere where they talk about XMRV, but this is what it shows. So this is an, an, on a lower power magnification. And remember I was showing you that there's a lipid envelope, and that's the lipid envelope, and inside this is the nucleocapsid, and within this is the genome. And it looks very similar to the virus that we've been studying for the last 12 years called malonine murine leukemia virus, and they have very similar capsids. And you can't see too much detail here, but there's a railroad track-like appearance here, and you see that here too. And these are immature capsids. So, so really these viruses are put together using the same kind of building blocks and in the same method. 